insistent upon it. Most of the changes they seem to want to make involve uh, taking away uh, subsidies or uh, Medicaid support for those that need it and redistributing that back to the wealthiest people so that they don't have to have a, a larger tax burden just to help support those who may need help. So that seems to be the, the, what the, the push is. And most people don't like that idea <laughs> when you break it down. Even the Republicans don't like that idea. And when you take it out to uh, the people, most people don't like that idea, except if you happen to be one of those wealthiest people uh, who would be getting a tax break. And even some of those don't like the idea. But again, when you stack up what you're supposed to, what you think you're supposed to stand for, uh, and you can't see beyond that, well, yes. There's going to be polarization. But here's the funny thing. We'll be apart for a while, I think. We'll be apart for a while till we turn around. It's, it's like one of those things like where maybe you're in a dark room. And you see something that you're kind of afraid of, you don't like. So you walk backwards. And that other person is walking backwards. And you keep walking backwards away from each other until you back into something and you turn around and it's the same person. So, in a weird way, our staying apart is part of the whole thing. And we'll stay apart until we're on the same side. And increasingly, I think if you talk, look at what they're talking about with this health care bill you're finding people that really are on the same side. They just either can't say it or they can't see it or they don't want to believe it. It's a very difficult time because there's some, there are very real issues that are important that affect people's lives. If you're someone who depends on uh, Medicaid for your health care, or you have a loved one who does, if you have an elderly uh, parent or loved one who's uh, in uh, an assisted living uh, or uh, care environment in which they depend on Medicaid, uh, then this is something that matters to you. And so there is no compromising with something like that when it affects your life. That's part of the issue. There are things that can be compromised upon. And there are times when compromise is the order of the day and, and rather easy to achieve. But I believe we've hit a point in history, and this is, I think, part of the transition era that I've talked about, where things are radically changing and have to radically change. And that kind of restricts the amount of compromise you can have. For instance, if you are a gay couple in this country and you love each other and you want to get married and have the same benefits, uh, that you are entitled to. Uh, you can't really see any reason to compromise on that. That's not compromise. Forgoing your own right to personal happiness, forgoing your own right to live like a human being, isn't compromise.
So there are things and times in history when compromise, as I say, is the order of the day. I think we happen to be in a time in history when compromise is very difficult to reach. And the reason is that we're dealing with issues that are extraordinarily impactful to people's lives and who they are. And some of that is what they call identity politics. People identify with being liberal or Republican or what have you or whatever we stand for. But there's a difference between that and being unwilling to compromise on that which would cause pain and suffering to you or your loved ones. Um, I don't think you can compromise on that. And things like bills that would take away uh, help for the neediest, things that would uh, prevent women from having access to uh, needed health care, including abortions, things that are harmful to other human beings just because of who and what they are, whether that's gay and lesbian or transgender, those are things you can't really compromise on. You can't compromise on different uh, treatment from law enforcement because of the color of your skin. That's not a compromisable issue. And that's why it's such a difficult time to get uh, well compromise to get people to work together that's why we are in this polarized state but again as the theme of the show is this is of our creation and since it's of our creation it is uh, something that we can and we will change as we wake up to our ability to do so okay enough of that right now so on to apotheosis. I'm oh, sorry, I keep saying that wrong. It's actually pronounced apotheosis. Apotheosis. It's a Greek word. And uh, technically, it means to deify or to make divine. It's also called deification or divinization. But none of those, uh, you know, very thumbnail uh, definitions really captures what apotheosis means. Apotheosis is a transformation. It's a becoming. And while, you know, the thumbnail descriptions of it hint at that, it's uh, the process of connecting to the divine within. It's a journey. So I'm going to talk about the different ways that apotheos the concept of apotheosis uh, appears uh, in theology and in literature and in art. And so we can have a, you know, uh, an understanding of this concept and, uh, you know, when a concept like this is talked about and I explained how it was being talked about in modern films, in the superhero genres, in the science fiction genres, the idea of uh, connecting to or people having abilities they didn't understand that they had before. Um, and this is something that we've been, has been very much in the popular imagination, uh, increasingly so, really since around 1999-2000, we began to play with the idea of what reality is and who we are in relation to it. It started with movies like The Matrix and even The Sixth Sense, 
which we began to explore and question uh, our concept of reality. And that went hand in hand with what was going on in quantum. Uh, let me get back to apotheosis. Okay, so it's the idea of an inv individual raised to a godlike stature, but it's taken on many uh, meanings. Uh, it, it stems from. groups that understood the idea of this transformation. Uh, it translated in Egypt, you know, the pharaohs were then, you know, deified as gods after they died. Now, in the Greek world, uh, it was, it began to be, starting with Philip II of Macedon, uh, it began to be uh, somewhat uh, common for kings to uh, accord themselves divine honors. And uh, in some cases, for instance, uh, the Greek poet Homer given to him uh, and certain state leaders such as Alexander the Great. Uh, now these hero cults, uh, and it's interesting, you know, that they're hero cults because uh, again we get back to that superhero obsession that we have, uh, but again uh, the classical Greek hero cults uh, were civic organizations um, and they extended from familial origins so families uh, were connected in these cults and traditionally uh, passed it down through their uh, progeny so by now they're saying here and I'm looking at uh, some information on on these cults by the fifth century None of their worshippers base their authority by tracing descent back to the hero. And now these heroes were linked with founding myths of Greek uh, sites. And temples were built to them, and their families uh, were their worshippers to begin with. Uh, but then, as time went on, uh, and the, the familial trace began to weaken uh, and worshippers based their authority by tracing descent back to the hero no more and with the exception of some families who inherited particularly priestly cults uh, such as the Eleusinian Mysteries which is a very very famous Greek cult The Greek hero cults uh, are distinguished differently because the hero was not thought of as of, of having ascended to heaven or become a god. Um, he had more local powers, and more powers that were linked to nature rather than an ascendant heaven. And it's in Rome where this process uh, begins to uh, change a little bit, and, uh, and of course, at first, it's uh, you know confined to uh, the rulers of Rome and senators and such until it became uh, actually it just became law that you know whoever was the